Dr. Christensen here. Welcome to my indoor writing retreat. <laughs> sanctuary, yeah, not a retreat. Sanctuary, usually a sanctuary, but uh, I, I want to take some time to do a few more Q&As. I've gotten some great questions in. I'd love to interact with you and, and help give good clarity for your, your steps to improve your health. Here's one from Victoria. Victoria is asking, how does the Adrenal Reset Diet work for those who have candida? I'm on a candida diet and I can't eat carbs. I'm trying to figure out what to do. So, awesome question, Victoria. This, this does happen. You know, yeast is a real thing. Uh, Dr. William Crook wrote The Yeast Connection, and this was probably back in the early 90s, and that was a new concept. There was a lot of opposition about it not being real or not being an actual thing. And I think there was a fad stage as well with it to where people thought that yeast was the cause of like every illness and everyone thought they had yeast. And you know, it's, it's not everyone, it's not all illnesses, but it is real. And there's a lot of ways in which the delicate balance of flora in the intestinal tract, when that's off, your health can really suffer. You know, there's things you make in your gut that are just like what you make in your brain. And we've seen that uh, there's compounds that can make you feel very sedated or very depressed or anxious. They can raise inflammation in your system. So a lot of things happen from yeast overgrowth. And we know about obvious yeast infections like vaginal yeast infections or skin or oral thrush, but you can have it in the intestines as well. So real phenomena. So how does diet affect candida? Well, think about baking or think about making things that work with yeast so like baking bread or I, i've never made beer i don't i'm not opposed i'm just not a, not a drinker myself but a lot of my friends have and i know how the process basically works so you need yeast you've got to use active yeast and you've got to get it growing and to get yeast growing you need sugar and sugar itself you know purified uh, sucrose table sugar if you mix it with yeast in warm temperatures the yeast starts to grow and multiply so the reasoning behind some of the current anti-candida diets has been any kind of carbohydrate could theoretically grow yeast. But it doesn't work that way. You know, sugar, there's two different perspectives. There's sugar to a chemist and sugar to a baker. Now sugar to a chemist, yeah, any kind of carbohydrate could be categorized chemically as a sugar because they're based upon small pieces of sugar that can be attached in various ways to each other, like, like big complex braids or branches. To a baker, however, it's a lot more simple. You know, sugar is the white powdery stuff that you use to bake with. <laughs> not, not flour, but sugar, they're different. And if you take yeast and you try to grow yeast only on flour, it will die, it will not work. If you're trying to bake bread or brew beer, you need sugar to start the yeast growing. And it's the same way in the intestinal tract. If your diet is very high in simple sugars, if you're pouring a lot of that directly in, that can stimulate yeast and cause it to overgrow. So one of the big tenets about anti-candida diets has been avoiding sugar. Now, one thing that acts like sugar is alcohol. So alcohol is like a super sugar. So alcohol can also quickly feed yeast if you've got too much yeast. But Complex carbs, like you would get from rice or beans and legumes, or potatoes or squash, they are not sugar to a baker. And if you're trying to bake bread, you can't put your yeast on rice and have the yeast grow. It will die. It needs sugar. So all carbs are not equal when it comes to yeast overgrowth. And in fact, some of the types of bacteria you grow after eating healthy carbs, they help to kill yeast. <laughs> so having more fiber that you get from good carbs, like the soluble, the insoluble, and the resistant fiber, that makes your flora resilient and able to keep yeast in its place. And the place is not none. We actually have a need for some small amounts of yeast in the intestinal tract. And you cannot eradicate it. It's a normal part of the flora. But you want it not to overgrow. You want things to be growing in a way that encourage just the smallest amounts of yeast and more amounts of protective bacteria. And paradoxically, carbs are needed for that. So good carbs feed those healthy bacteria. So yeah, you don't have to cut out all carbs. It actually would not be effective for you to cut out all carbs. But I would encourage you to really cut out the processed and refined sugars. Now, fruit juice can act like that, and dried fruit is kind of gray. It can also act in those ways. Whole fruit also really will not feed or overgrow yeast. So my recommendations for cutting out yeast are really just processed sugar and alcohol. 
There are other foods that have yeast, like fermented foods or vinegar or mushrooms. Those won't grow yeast. You know, test it out yourself in the kitchen. You can take a packet of yeast and put some vinegar on there and see what happens. The yeast is going to die. <laughs> Actually, vinegar is acetic acid, and that's something used to kill yeast. You put acetic acid drops in your ear if you've got yeast overgrowth in your ear. So yeah, vinegars, mushrooms, fermented foods, they don't cause yeast to grow. It's just sugar and alcohol. So yeast happens as far as your diet goes. Focus on those foods. Some people need short courses of natural antifungals. You know, garlic, ginger can be helpful that way as well. And make sure your floor is in good shape and you can do a lot better without needing a super restricted diet. So great question, Victoria, and take great care of yourself.